welcome you to the University Research Center Lunchtime Series. Um, and on behalf of the center, I'd like to invite you to grab a flyer and a sticker on your way out and please mark the future dates for our diverse series of presentations coming up this semester, which are occurring on a variety of weekdays at noon. Uh, so today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Dylan Stiersky. Um, he is an ecologist and field biologist. He earned his master's in biology from Illinois State University, studying life history, uh, ecology, and songbirds, and a PhD in entomology from Auburn University, studying ant-plant interactions and agroecosystems. He joined the Department of Biology here in 2006 and teaches upper-level courses in ecology, ornithology, entomology, in addition to the milkweed research he's going to talk about today, he also does research in Panama, studying uh, interactions among acacia plants, ants, and spiders. So with that, I'll turn it over to John to tell us all about his fascinating research. All right, thank you, Jamie, for that introduction. And thank you all for being here. So uh, I want to share with you today some research that uh, my wife, Dr. Jennifer Sierski, and I have been uh, uh, doing in collaboration with colleagues at several other institutions, including St. Ola College and Gustavus Adolphus College in Minnesota, Denison University, National Land University in Ohio, and Purdue University in Indiana. So this work grew out of a collaborative uh, project from an organization called Erin. It's got the logo down at the bottom of the screen. Um, this group was established in 2010 the grant from the NSF, the National Science Foundation, to establish an ecological research and education network at PUIs, or primarily undergraduate institutions. So there are uh, more and more people out there that um, acknowledge that there are lots of talented scientists at PUIs, but the research aspirations are limited um, in terms of facilities, resources, time, compared to, uh, compared to faculty of R1 institutions. So Aaron has three main objectives, and I'm just going to read them because they're written very well. The first is to develop collaborative research projects among PUIs at regional to continental scales, paying special attention to the constraints of scientists with significant teaching responsibilities. The second is designing those projects to achieve and maximize student engagement in authentic science, while still maintaining a goal of generating transformative publication quality data. And three, creating ecology curricula using data from collaborative projects as a centerpiece. So uh, Jennifer and I have been collaborating, or participating in one of the original ERIN projects, a milkweed project. And after collecting a few years of preliminary data, we decided with our colleagues, collaborators, to take this to the next level. And we applied for and were awarded a grant from the National Science Foundation totaling $1.2 million. We've completed two years of field work and have one more field season to tackle in 2023. So far, our work has resulted in one research publication, six research presentations at regional, national, and international scientific conferences. 40 undergraduate students have participated directly in the project as field assistants or junior collaborators. But um, hundreds of other students have interfaced with this research as students in ecology courses here at UL and at our collaborators' home institutions. So, with that background, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the project, what we're up to. So, you all um, are most likely familiar with the monarch butterfly. It's an iconic species because of its remarkable natural history. So, the adult butterflies overwinter uh, in a few isolated kind of mountain, mountains down in south-central Mexico. You see that blue star down there. Um, where they occur in the hundreds of millions and they can completely blanket the uh, pine trees that they roost on over, over winter. You may have seen pictures like this before. Um, as spring comes, the adults move north into Texas and the Gulf Coast states where they breed, lay their eggs on milkweed plants uh, and die. The eggs hatch, the caterpillars develop um, into new adults and then those adults fly farther north where they do the same thing, lay their eggs on milkweed plants, the caterpillars hatch, uh, develop into new adult butterflies, and they fly a little farther north and breed and start all over again. So they kind of move up through North America in stages over the course of the summer. Um, the important thing here is that they're tracking the spring emergence and growth of milkweed plants, which is the only thing that monarch caterpillars will eat. 
So modern caterpillars, here's a picture of them, um, have evolved an intimate relationship with milkweed plants in a way that circumvents uh, the milkweed plant defenses. So milkweeds produce these toxic steroids called cardenolides uh, in their sac that when ingested, they bind with sodium potassium pumps in their cardiac muscle uh, and essentially stop their hearts from beating. So that kills the insects that feed on the plants. But monarchs have evolved the ability to more or less prevent those uh, cardinalized from binding with the cardiac muscle. And so they can feed uh, on the milky plants uh, pretty much unimpeded. So uh, by specializing on milkweeds, the monarchs pretty much guarantee that their larvae will not face a lot of competition for food. All right, as the summer wanes, so by now they're way up far north into southern Canada, um, those adult butterflies, which can be up to six generations removed from the first butterflies that flew out of Mexico, um, fly south. And despite having never made that journey before and being six generations removed, perhaps, from uh, their ancestors that made the northward journey, they somehow can find their way all the way back down south to that particular little set of mountains um, where they overwinter again. So that's what's pretty amazing about this, this whole uh, the species. One. Okay. So, unfortunately, the monarch pop uh, population in the east, there are two populations, the western and the eastern. The eastern population is the one that does this migratory journey. Um, the eastern monarch population has been in uh, kind of a steady decline, um, rep representing the loss of hundreds of millions of butterflies over the past two or three decades. So this graph shows the total forest area occupied by monarch colonies. It's hard to go out there and actually count the butterflies. It's easier to just estimate their abundance by uh, determining the coverage uh, on the ground. Um, one hectare represents about, let me make sure I got that right, 50 million monarch butterflies. So this loss over these three decades represents the loss of many hundreds of millions of <coughs> monarchs. The green dotted line um, represents the um, estimated number of butterflies, around 300 million, uh, required to maintain the population so that it does not go extinct. And you can see that the monarch numbers have been uh, well below that for some time now. So the uh, question is, why is the monarch population declining? Um, and uh, the vexing thing is that there really isn't a good answer. Um, there are lots of hypotheses. One, climate change. Um, the second, there's uh, illegal logging in the overwintering areas of the butterflies. So even though they're the, the trees that they overwinter on are protected they, uh, in a preserve, they, there's still illegal logging that happens there. Um, but one of the main hypotheses for their decline is that there has been a concomitant decline in the abundance of common milkweed, and that's their major food plant um, across North America. So, um, Milkweeds, remember, the only one uh, plant that, that uh, monarchs can eat. So this could explain why there's a decline in, in monarch populations. Um, a couple of reasons for why there's a decline in common milkweed. One is a uh, dramatic increase in the use of herbicides like Roundup. They're used to control weeds around uh, agricultural fields. And also an increased amount of acres being put into agriculture and uh, development of habitat, so they're losing plants losing habitat. Um, but overall, some estimates uh, show that common milkweed has declined by 50 to 90 percent. So in response to this decline, uh, conservation agencies like National Wildlife Foundation are growing, collecting, and distributing milkweed seeds to local conservation agencies and highway departments and so forth, um, and the public in an attempt to restore milkweed Populations. So the idea is to distribute the seeds, go out and plant them, and we can have more. Uh, replace the milkweed that we're losing. Um, while this is commendable, there is a potential problem, and that is that common milkweed populations may be adapted to local environmental conditions, and that is called local adaptation. Um, the problem is that this can limit the effectiveness of establishing new milkweed populations and that hampers milkweed restoration efforts and therefore may hamper uh, conservation of the monarch butterfly. 
So let me explain what uh, local adaptation is. All right, so I'll do that using this map. The United States, obviously, the green shaded counties represent where common milkweed uh, grows naturally. It's native to those areas. You can see there's a large area of the United States uh, that, 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 uh, where milkweed, common milkweed grows. It grows on up into southern Canada as well, so that's not shown in the map. So a very large area um, encompassing uh, a range of latitudes and longitudes and elevation as well. So uh, defined, local adaptation is genetic differentiation among populations caused by differing selection pressures in different local environments. And so what I mean by that is that uh, natural selection may favor certain growth and development traits that maximize plant fitness in one environment, so say down here in Virginia, but favor different growth and development traits in different environmental conditions. For example, up in Maine, right? The, the, the climate in Virginia is quite different from the climate in Maine. So natural selection may favor different combinations of traits. Um, if we just think about how the environments uh, vary across the uh, range of common milkweed, think about latitude. Um, as you move north, Summers are cooler, or cooler uh, over the winter as well. Shorter growing season and less intense solar radiation. And as you move south, there are uh, warmer average temperatures, much longer growing seasons, more intense solar radiation. So climate related variables uh, vary quite a bit across latitudes, but there also um, is uh, uh, differences. There are differences in uh, biotic pressures, such as uh, herbivore pressure, and what I mean by that is um, the abundance and uh, diversity of species that eat plants. So uh, in general, as you move farther north, there are fewer insect herbivores, and they don't uh, reach really large population sizes as, like they do down farther south. The longer growing season, the populations can grow much larger than they do in the north. Okay, so because of local adaptation, it may be important to use locally sourced seeds in plant restoration efforts. The phenomenon of local adaptation is, is seemingly fairly common in plants, but the degree to which local adaptation occurs varies widely. So um, our main uh, questions are feet. Is common milkweed locally adapted? If so, how strongly locally adapted is it? And then third, um, what particular components of the environment are driving it? So what specific traits are under selection that's causing genetic differentiation across the range of milkweed that leads to local adaptation? All right, what do you look like? So in plants with wide geographic ranges, Local adaptation is suggested by gradients in plant traits across geographic gradients. Gradients, you can be talking about latitude or longitude or, or elevation, but uh, these geographic gradients in the expression of specific traits are called clines. And so here I'm showing you a couple of clines uh, with respect to two plant traits. So if you went out and did a field survey, for example, where you sampled uh, plant growth rate on the uh, left over there, um, in various populations across the latitude and gradient, um, you would see that plants grow more slowly in the south and they grow more rapidly in the north. Um, that's a, a climb. Um, you'd see something similar with seed mass. So uh, again, if you went out and collected seeds from various populations across that gradient of latitudes, you'd see that plants in the south produce smaller seeds and as you move north, they produce larger and larger seeds, so the plants growing farthest north produce the largest seed. So the idea is that you're seeing a shift in how plants allocate resources to growth and reproduction based on a shift in environmental conditions across the geographic range. Now, the existence of these clines doesn't unequivocally demonstrate local adaptation or this doesn't show necessarily genetic differentiation across 
and different populations across latitudes. Um, and that is because of a phenomenon called phenotypic plasticity. So uh, phenotypic plasticity refers to the ability of a single genotype to produce or express different phenotypes when exposed to different environmental conditions. And just to make sure it's clear on that, your genotype is simply the combination of genes that you have. And your phenotype is the physical, physiological, behavioral expression of those genes. Um, and the, for many traits, the expression of your genes is affected by the environment. Um, and just as a quick example, the um, tanning salon industry very much relies on phenotypic plasticity. So you can change your phenotype, even though your genes don't change, you can go change your phenotype by hanging out in a tanning bed for a while, exposing yourself to UV radiation, or just staying outside all summer uh, without being covered up in um, that your skin produces more melanin. So you have genes to produce melanin that pigment in your skin, but depending on your exposure to solar radiation, uh, the expression of how much melanin you produce can vary. That's phenotypic plasticity. So, for example, this climb, then it could be that all the plant populations are genetically more or less the same. It's just that they're uh, across latitudes, they're being exposed to different uh, environmental variables, different climate related variables. And so that causes a change in how the plants grow. So, local environmental conditions can alter the expression of the common genotype, giving rise to these climbs. So, how do we go about determining whether these climbs are actually? Uh, represent local adaptation, or if it's just uh, phenotypic plasticity. And so for that, we have to rely on uh, a trick. Uh, and that trick is called the common garden experiment. So what I have here is the same map, and I've just uh, highlighted six different populations, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And in a common garden experiment, what you do is you take uh, seeds or plants from each of the different populations, and you move them all to a single common garden, for example, here in Virginia, uh, and let them grow there. So you grow plants from multiple populations across a geographic gradient or environmental gradient in one location. And what that does is it basically holds the environment constant. So it takes that piece of the puzzle away and then thereby unmasks any underlying genetic effects. So just to kind of explain that a little bit more. Let's say, again, that example where I talked about before, you go out and you go to all those different populations and you sample, uh, observe plant growth rate, measure that, and you, you plot the average growth rate on the graph against the latitude of the population that it came from, <clears throat> and you see a climb like that, right? That's just something that you, you can go out and observe. If you then take plants from all those populations, grow them in a single common garden. And if you then see the same climb, right? So you still see the plants from southern latitudes growing more slowly and the plants from northern latitudes growing more rapidly. That indicates local adaptation, right? You've taken away the environmental component. So the only thing that it can explain that difference in average plant growth rate across the populations is genetic, um, indicating that those different populations are um, genetically different from each other. And I, I, let me back up just a second. I forgot to mention uh, that may help. The, even though this is a very large range, it's not like this is just common milkweed all the way across from one end to the other, right? The common milkweed, like any other plant, grows in patches. It doesn't grow in forests. It's, it's kind of an open, weedy field type um, plant. And so you have these little uh, separated populations of common that we all throughout that range. So the potential is there for them to be somewhat genetically isolated from each other, depending on how much gene flow is going on. So this is the whole idea of what we're doing, to try to find uh, if, if common milkweed is locally adapted or not. This is, we're doing these common garden experiments. And this is the pattern of these, these clients. So we've set up three of these. Uh, three locations across the range uh, of common milkweed and across a latitudinal gradient and a longitudinal gradient. So each one of these points on the map, the state lines are kind of hard to see there, but you can see the Great Lakes, obviously. Um, each of those points represents one of the population that we've collected 
seeds from. Um, there are 20 of them. All those seeds were collected by volunteers in those areas and they sent them all to our colleague at St. Olaf College in Minnesota, who then uh, divided them all up and distributed them to uh, the two other common gardens in addition to her own. So one here in Virginia and one in, in Ohio. So 20 populations are sampled across uh, latitude and the longitudinal gradient. 10 genotypes were sampled from each population. So 10 individual plants were taken um, that were not, that are collected far enough apart from each other, they, they were not uh, related to each other. And then in each of the common gardens, we have uh, seven replicates of each genotype. So in each common garden, we have about 1,400 plants total um, that we have growing. Um, this type of common garden experiment where you have multiple identical common gardens across a gradient, a geographic gradient, is called a reciprocal transplant experiment. Um, and it allows us to look beyond just uh, environmental versus genetic effects. It also allows us to look for gene binding interactions, which I'm not going to go into here. Um, but it just makes this a little more complicated, uh, but allows us to, to dig into this a little more, uh, a little deep. Okay, so um, the common garden we have here in Virginia is out of Claytor Nature City. That's where we, we set this up. So let me kind of tell you a little bit about what we had to do. Um, those seeds were collected in 2019, and we were planning on getting this set up in 2020, but that's when the pandemic hit. So we had to postpone everything. The seeds uh, are kept, they have to go through a simulated winter for them to develop properly. A lot of plants are like that. So you have to do what, what's termed cold stratification, where you put them in baggies with a little a sand and a, a little bit of moisture and you keep them in the refrigerator. Normally that's only for a few months, but we had to keep them in the refrigerator for over a year because of the pandemic. But um, we actually, that didn't cause any problems. We still have really good germination success. Um, so here we have students uh, on the left. Um, we had to take all of You can see Jennifer kind of in the background with, uh, in front of a bunch of a tray with a bunch of those baggies full of seeds. And she was distributing them. We had to um, plant the seeds in these little seed starter trays uh, in a, a randomized fashion. Um, and we had to germinate or plant enough seeds that we would have enough plants to use in the common garden. So I think we germinated or, or planted around 7,500 seeds. Um, and about 75% germinated, so we had a ton of seedlings. Um, Dan Miles, the former caretaker out of Claytor, set rigged up this fantastic grow light system um, in the old uh, milking barn. Tom, you probably recognize the blue. Yeah. This is a fishery facility at some point, one point, right? Yeah. So we uh, rigged this up in there. We, we germinated our seedlings. In there. While the seedlings were germinating, uh, we had to prepare the field, uh, which is just right outside of this particular building, um, for the plants. And uh, that required uh, the use of a skid steer with a big auger attachment, and we had to go out and drill 1,400 holes. Um, and so we shot out to the uh, grounds crew. They helped a lot with this. Um, as we dug the holes, we arranged the, all the holes in blocks randomized block design for those interested. Um, and we took the soil that came up out of those holes, filled three gallon plastic pots, and we sunk the pots down into the ground. So you see the students doing that there. So once we got our holes dug and all the pots in the ground, we were then, and the, the plants were at the right stage for transplanting, we moved them outside, and they had to be outside for a few hours a day at first to get them what's called hardened off. So they're used to being sunlight versus under a grow light. Um, and then we had to go plant all these different uh, milkweeds in these pots. Um, and again, they're all labeled so we can keep track of what genotype and what population each pot represents. So we're interested in lots of different uh, plant physical and physiological traits. Uh, but we're also interested in uh, ecological trade-offs among the traits across the geographic range of milkweed. So I've grouped the data uh, we're collecting in four categories, and I'll provide a little bit more information about what we're collecting.
you so you have an idea of what we're doing out there. So um, the one category is investment in plant growth and development. So this includes things like the emergence date. So uh, around the time of expected emergence, we go out to the field and, and look for the, the plants as they're coming up to try to get the uh, roughly uh, date when they're emerging. Count the number of stems, stem height, um, we measure growth rate, count the number of leaves, and we measure leaf size. And other data, um, collect other data on phenology of annual growth and senescence. So, so the timing, when the plants come up, when they start producing leaves, uh, when they, the leaves start to die back, uh, when the stems die back. We're also interested in several reproductive traits. So we count, uh, if the plants are flowering, we count the number of flowers, the number of seed pods, and the number and size of seeds. Um, we haven't done this yet, but we're collecting seeds from these pods to do some seed viability uh, studies. Uh, since we're ultimately we're interested in the, uh, increasing, the, the, improving the fitness of common milkweed wherever populations are being restored. Um, then also data on phenology of reproduction. So again, the timing of reproduction, um, when the plants begin to flower, when they begin to produce pods, when those pods ripen and open, that kind of stuff. We're also interested in um, several plant defense traits. So um, that includes things like the number of leaf trichomes. So this picture on the left over there, that's a, a disc from a leaf that was uh, punched out with a little one-hole punch. Um, we put this under a microscope and we take a photo of it so that we can then go back in and count the number of these little hairs. So little plant hairs on leaf are called trichomes and they function as a defense mechanism because they make it difficult for insects to get down the leaf surface to eat it. You have to kind of wade through all those hairs. Um, so leaf trichomes, uh, latex production is something we also are quantifying. So um, I mentioned that the cardenolides in the sap, but the sap itself is also uh, provides some defense against the because it, it's thick, viscous, and it, it gets sticky really fast. So if, if the leaf is damaged by, for example, something biting into the leaf that looks like Elmer's glue, but that latex-like sap oozes out and gums up the mouth parts of an insect. Um, and if they're small enough, like this uh, first uh, instar baby uh, monarch caterpillar, that can get stuck in it, and then as it gets tacky, they're glued to the plant surface, and then they can't go in. Um, so the way that we quantify that is we take a piece of uh, filter paper that we've gotten to wait for beforehand, and uh, we go out to the field and, and snip off one of the leaves, and then we collect this latex sap that oozes out on the filter paper um, until it stops oozing. And then uh, we'll let that dry, the, the paper dry, and then we go back and weigh it again. The difference between the weight after and weight before is the, represents the amount of latex that's been produced. We're also um, interested in, I mentioned this before, I'm particularly interested in um, how biotic variables like herbivores and pollinators are influencing local adaptation. So we are recording herbivore species abundance, our species, I, we're identifying them and then um, we're, uh, recording their abundance and also uh, measuring the damage um, they inflict on the plants. And that's, um, it's pretty easy to assign damage uh, to different insect herbivores because of the, the way it looks. So, on the left over there, where the leaf gets skeletonized like that, um, that that's a slug or a snail did that. That's the kind of damage they do. Those are uh, oleander aphids. There in the next picture over, um, just one of the many uh, herbivores that are adapted to feeding on milkweed. There aren't that many, but there are a few. This is a red milkweed beetle down here in the bottom right, and they also leave a particular type of damage. They've evolved uh, this really neat ability um, to basically cut off the flow of the latex towards the tip of the leaf. So they will, you can see right here, 
those are the bite marks that they made on the underside of the leaf where they cut the main vein. Uh, they then go down to the tip of the leaf uh, where the latex flow has been cut off and they feed on the leaf down there so they don't have to worry about gumming up their mouth. So even if we don't see the herbivore in there, we can usually tell what it is. Uh, here, stem damage is caused by a particular weevil species that causes that kind of damage in the stem. So, um, I'm just going to show you some preliminary results. We haven't gotten too far with this yet. And I'm just going to focus on some data we've collected here in Virginia. Um, stuff we've done so far, for the most part, we've just been looking within our own common gardens. Um, once we have all three years worth of data, we'll start putting all the data together. I'm going to show you some of the things we've seen so far. So, uh, as I mentioned before, after planting the seeds, we recorded how long it took for the seeds to germinate. Um, and this graph's a little fuzzy, I apologize for that. This I just took from uh, a manuscript we submitted to Restoration Ecology, which we just found out last week was accepted for publication. So this is I didn't generate the graph myself. Uh, in this graph, you see mean generation time uh, in days on the uh, vertical axis and then latitude of the source population on the horizontal axis. Each point represents the mean germination time for a particular genotype. And each column represents uh, a particular population of the weed that was sampled. So there's different populations we sampled across different latitudes, and each of those points within the populations is shown as a little triangle. Uh, it represents a specific plant the seeds came from. So you can see in this, in this figure that um, the seeds from southern populations took longer to germinate than the seeds from northern populations. There's a general downward trend as you move north in latitude. So, uh, reduction in time, germination time. Um, and that may represent an adaptation to shorter growing seasons in higher latitudes. Um, we're seeing this across a suite of traits that sort of uh, suggests that the common milkweeds growing in northern latitudes are, are kind of sped up in their overall life history. They grow and develop faster than the plants farther south. Consistent with that, this is a graph uh, of mean plant height or early season growth um, from our common garden in Virginia. And this graph was produced by a student in an ecology lab that we do. So we're looking at um, mean plant height early in the season, and that represents uh, early season growth rate, more or less. Um, so it's kind of a combination of emergence time and how fast they're growing initially. Um, and again, we see a climb here. This time, uh, we're seeing that the plants in this, uh, that came from southern latitudes grow, aren't growing as tall as fast um, early in the season, whereas plants, as you go north in latitude, are, are shooting up faster. Um, so again, this sort of represents this um, potentially this adaptive response to shorter growing seasons at higher latitudes, where the plants have to get up and grow faster um, because they don't have as much time as long as the growing season before they have to, to to reach some stage of development, for example, to reproduce. So a couple of climbs there. Um, we're also seeing uh, climbs in some other plant traits like leaf dimensions. So uh, these graphs show uh, the uh, climbs in mean leaf length and mean leaf width. Um, and again, they're, they're, um, uh, each point represents the mean for a particular genotype, and each column represents a population. So um, what you see here is that the, mean, the uh, leaves in plants from southern populations are typically longer and wider, and as you move north in latitude, leaves get shorter and skinnier. Um, that's not uncommon in plants. Uh, part of that is because larger leaves are prone to frost, more prone to frost damage in cooler environments. 
Um, that has to do with surface area to volume ratio. So the bigger leaves, um, it's easier for them to radiate more heat away at night, and so they cool off more quickly in cold conditions, and um, it's harder for them to warm up the next day. So plants in the north typically have smaller leaves to guard against frost damage. Um, what will be interesting to see is if this reduced investment in leaf, leaf size or leaves, uh, slows maturation or delays reproduction in, uh, at higher latitudes. So that's one of the things we're looking at. Um, okay, and then one more I'll show you. This shows a latitudinal climb in a defense tree. This is latex production. The climb isn't really strong here, but um, in the graphs from, which I don't have from the other common gardens, you see this as a, as a stronger negative slope. Um, so what we're seeing here is uh, mean latex mass and how that, uh, on this latex that we sampled, and how that changes over latitude. You can see that farther south, the plants are producing more latex when they're damaged. And farther north, the amount of latex they produce when damaged. Climates. So again, this could represent an, ad, an adaptive response to reduce herbivore pressure at higher latitudes. As I mentioned that before, as you go up in latitude, there are typically fewer herbivore species and the populations don't get as large. Um, or as you go south, you have uh, greater herbivore pressure. And this could also represent a, a reflective trade-off for greater investment in reproduction in shorter growing season. So instead of investing a lot in this defense, when you don't really need to, uh, you can then allocate these resources towards uh, some other aspect of growth or reproduction. So we're going to be kind of digging into that as well. So, um, what should I say next? This, so far, what I've shown you, I hadn't shown you a whole lot, but what I've shown you uh, suggests that common milkweed populations are showing some evidence of local adaptation. So if this holds up, it will support the idea that milkweed restoration efforts should grow locally sourced seeds. We should be using locally sourced seeds to then restore milkweed plant populations. The plants that are locally sourced, grow from locally sourced seeds, should be more vigorous and have greater fitness ultimately benefiting not only monarch butterfly populations, but also um, hundreds of other species that utilize milkweed flowers for nectar, so lots of other native pollinators, um, and milkweed plants for food or shelter or, or, or hunting grounds or whatever. So there are other components of this project. I just showed you one small part of it, and I can't go into all of these today, but I can at least kind of uh, tell you a little bit about it briefly. So um, one of those, uh, I mentioned before, we're collecting the data on the identity and abundance of different herbivore species and quantifying damage to plants. So those species, uh, and, and as well as pollinators, are likely um, strong agents of, selections, of, of selection on milkweed plants. But their importance in driving local adaptation compared with abiotic variables like climate-related variables hasn't really been studied. Um, so within each of the three common gardens, we're also doing kind of a little sub-experiment where we're, we're manipulating um, the presence and absence of herbivory or herbivores, and then we're going to see how the plants respond uh, within uh, this experiment to the presence of herbivores, and then tie that into how the plants grow and develop over the lifetime. So again, the idea is we're trying to figure out um, what variables are really driving this genetic differentiation across populations, across the range of, of, of across latitudes. Another uh, aspect, the, the common garden experiment will allow us to see these climbs, which is evidence for local adaptation, but we want to dig into that a little bit more and really look for genetic evidence um, to determine which specific traits are, are um, being most strongly affected by natural selection. So this involves uh, Population genetics, and I mean, I'll tell you right now, that's sort of outside my wheelhouse, but 
um, where there are microsatellites, which are little repeated sections of DNA that you can use to determine uh, the amount of genetic differentiation across um, separate populations um, that involves measuring genetic variants at traits that are likely under selection and comparing that against genetic variants at neutral sites, so, so other parts or other uh, uh, traits that are, are presumably not under selection. You can then tell uh, hopefully what traits um, selection is acting on to drive these populations apart. Uh, so that's another aspect that we're, we're currently working on. And then finally, um, a big component of this, which I'm barely going to mention, but uh, there's a pedagogical component to this project. It was written in a grant. Um, and that is to develop curricula on local adaptation, evolution, and conservation for college and secondary education courses. So multiple modules are being developed and beta tested at the moment in which students set up simplified versions of these field experiments at their home institutions and collect and analyze their own data. And we will then, um, all those data will be shared in, in one sort of repository and we'll be able to, to ask some additional questions going forward with all those data. So uh, that's all I'm going to talk about because I'm just about out of time. I just, before I stop, I just want to express um, a big thank you, um, a sincere thank you to all of our field assistants and research students. Um, this is some of them. All these students are, are present or uh, former students here at UL, except for my son Kai, he's in high school, so we kind of roped him into helping out. Um, so with that, thank you all for your listening, and I'll try to answer any questions. Yes, so um, it, it sort of depends on how the strength of selection, what its agent of selection is, how long it's going to take, and, and how much genetic variation there is for selection to act on as far as how rapidly it would respond at a population level. Um, and so you've been, the second part of that is you're talking about mixing, genetic mixing. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying if you bring in a Right, potentially if there's cross-pollination going on, right? 
So that's kind of where the question of uh, ecological trade-offs come in. Um, and what we're interested in, in getting at is, um, you know, certain uh, traits are favored in one environment uh, at the expense of others, but then you have a different genotype come in uh, that, that where the, the other traits have been selected for at the expense of the ones in the first population, then you're going to have potentially some, you know, competing selection pressures going on. You know, as far as like how long that's going to take to work itself out, I don't know. But, uh, that's presumably what's going on now in certain places where they've been distributing seeds. The seeds we collected, the, the populations we sampled were all as long established populations that, that weren't, you know, new populations recently established by uh, distributing seeds. So we're trying to find uh, sample populations that had undergone you know, many, many years of selection in that particular environment they were for this experiment. Mm -hmm. Tom? I, I don't know, I, I, is it really interesting to plant data? Or, or is part of the project to collect any interaction with the actual butterflies? It just seems interesting to me that if you had a mixed plot of milkweed, it would be really fascinating to know if the there was any, anything going on? Yes. Yes. So we are collecting data on. Um, we haven't so much yet as far as uh, uh, monarch visitation to the flowers. Uh, this past year, we had about thirty percent of the plants flower here in Virginia. In the other two gardens, they're not flowering yet. So we're seeing that happening sooner down here. But um, so we are going to be looking at pollinator visitation data. But we're also recording uh, anytime we find milkweed or uh, monarch eggs or monarch caterpillars on the plants. And they, um, we haven't um, really looked at that just yet, but it's not, we're hoping to see that they're going to be favoring certain genotypes over others. <laughs> um, presumably the, the local ones, since they're adapted to the local conditions. And so we will be looking at that. Uh, butterflies. Um, the milkweed isn't affected by the butterflies visiting the flowers. So the monarch butterflies actually cannot pollinate milkweed flowers. They're too big. Um, so the, mo the milkweeds don't really get anything out of this relationship. They just eat them. <laughs> uh, but uh, they, it's bees and beetles that can pick up the little packets of pollen and move them around. And the butterflies can't do it. The big butterflies can't do it. So we will be looking at that. Yes, Rita. Um, first, congratulations on the acceptance of your journal article. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, and my question that comes from a very, very layperson perspective, and I know your study is about local adaptation, right, of variation, these five, six variants of seeds, etc. But from your initial findings, you said that the northern seeds seem to be stronger and environmentally, right, with the smaller leaves and everything else, uh, they seem to be doing much better than the southern seeds. Am I correct in understanding uh, I that? No, I wouldn't say that they were uh, doing better. They just grow differently. They grow differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if the determinants of that difference is better variance, or um, and, and even if it's not definitively stronger, but even better adaptability, and, and, and maybe I misunderstood what you were saying, but it seemed like the trend in the graphs that you were showing was better adaptability by the northern seas versus the southern seas. Like there, so, um, yes. Um, if you misunderstood that, I'm sure it was my fault. So, no, no, they <laughs> they, uh, they're not doing any better necessarily. They're just doing, um, they're showing differences in growth that perhaps reflect um, being adapted to the particular conditions they're right. coming right. from. Right. Yes. So, so I think my question doesn't quite change that. Um, if they're doing slightly better, even marginally better, uh -huh. Would it, would it then be better to bring in more of the northern seas rather than the southern? So there, um, 
they're when, it, when when you're better, it just means it's not that they're growing better for the local conditions here. Okay. They're just okay. growing as they would as, uh, as they would in the population that they came in. So they, they're sure. better. They're growing in a way that would be better suit the conditions they came from. Now there is, however, um, some question about um, uh, what you're talking about, where the, the plants, if you move them into a novel environment, um, they may do better than native plants uh, in some situations. For example, if they can escape um, or avoid herbivory. Right? So in that case, they might actually do better than the plants that are locally adapted. Um, just because the herbivores in the garden that you're growing them in have no yeah, experience with that particular genotype. Right. Right. So um, that's an interesting question. And uh, we should be able to get at that a little bit with the uh, other experiment I was talking about that we have going. I didn't present it here. But, yeah. Is that a good question? Jamie? Completely unscientific question. Yes. Uh, so when I want to plant some milkweed plants to support our local, you know, traveling monarch butterflies, are you a resource or can you point me towards some resources for local <laughs> seeds? Like, I have lots of milkweed seeds at my Are they local? Yeah, we let them just because I sort of knew about this issue, yeah. I let them go and so now we have a Most wild populations seeds. around here were not planted. Maybe Highway mediums, but um, other than that, you just go collect the pods and put the seeds in the refrigerator over the winter in a bag of sand that's moist, and then plant them the next year. Okay. We'll circle back to that later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're actually really easy to, to germ. Alice? So, where do the seeds, most of the seeds, come from that, um, you know, the department, DOT's plant in the, you know, that's on the highway? A good question. Uh, I don't really have the answer to that. Uh, I know in some places there are conservation organizations that are going out and harvesting seeds locally and then distributing to highway departments. I don't know what's coming here. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, <clears throat> I guess it was um, Jennifer who asked a, a question earlier, which really got to the heart of my question, because how long does it take for these species to really do that level of adaptation? Mm -hmm. Is it a number of single digit years, decades, or, or longer? You know, how long have those populations been separate enough to show the genetic difference? Right, well, so the ones we're sampling from presumably have been just growing wild naturally. Um, so you, know, you can't really put a time on that. But, uh, going back to what I was saying before, uh, I mean, that's something nobody's really looked at to try to figure out how long it's going to take. Um, and it really comes down to how strong the selection pressure is and how much genetic variation there is for the selection to act on, to how quickly it will shift. 